Good morning. My copy of the Portland transcript from 1866, which contains the imitation Ethan Spike story, seems to be hung up in the mails in some little town in Pennsylvania. So uh, since the recent entry in which I demonstrated the interconnected tapestry of Matthew Franklin Whittier's work and life by getting into my database seems to have been fairly popular. I thought I'd do that again. And whereas previously what I was trying to demonstrate was how interconnected that tapestry actually is, this time I just want to give some extent of the vastness of this database. Over 2,300 of Matthew Franklin Whittier's works published from 1825 when he was 12 years old up until 1875 in quite a number of publications over the years. He had his favorites and then there were a few apparently he dipped into. There's probably a lot that I missed. I figured that I may have a tenth of his total output, you know, now, even at that. So uh, what I'm going to do is try to work with this split screen, which is a little bit awkward for me. So uh, let's see. Here is my database. And uh, you can see it goes all the way from... Uh, well, B.P. Shillaber, that's the ones that Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, uh, one would think that he wrote, but actually Matthew was the writer. And then uh, we go all the way down to the last one here is Yankee Doodle, which is the uh, humorous magazine, the first American magazine to imitate punch in England. Got them alphabetical. So what I'm going to do is split my screen, but I'm going to try not to talk when I'm moving um, the... Uh, computer here because uh, my computer's too old and I get lip sync problems. I'm going to put myself down in the corner and that will leave the database a little larger. You could still see that I'm closing my eyes and I'm going to stop talking and see if I can select one. All right, um, I have ended up with Harvardiana. That is the uh, student publication for Harvard. We're going back to the 1830s. You'll see that I put this in possible. And there's only two of them. They are both signed ELAW. And this was an interesting situation because it's the only time that I got a clue as to authorship from penciled in notes in the antiquarian original that I purchased. I've for years been hoping that I would purchase one of these things and find Matthew's initials in them, you know. Well, you know, dream on, you know, or some kind of note. I wrote this MFW, something like that. No such thing. The closest I got to that was one of these poems that was in an album that Matthew signed, which I've shared before. In this case, the antiquarian copies of Harvardiana came in. And while we're at it, I guess I can show them to you. So we'll do our little magic while I go get those. All right, here we are. This is what Harvardi Harvardiana looked like back in the early 1830s. Uh, in the copy that I have, someone has penciled in, in the margin, who wrote each of the pieces because they're signed with pseudonym. So here we have a poem on the back of this one, which has no back cover. The poem is called To Adela, and underneath where it's signed Ela, they've written Hale. Well, that's Edward Everett Hale, if I'm not mistaken. He was a child prodigy, like Matthew. He was attending Harvard at age 13, if I understand correctly. Matthew wanted to do that, but he was not permitted to go and had to get his education on his own and through his young friend and future wife, Abby Poyan, who uh, was getting a high-class tutored European-style education and gave it to him. But in this case, this is signed by Edward Everett Hale. But I knew that this was Matthew's poem that he plagiarized. And the way I knew it is one of the other ones. Now, this edition, this is... Um, well, these are in Roman numerals, but this, I believe, is 36, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, on the back, there's the contents. And one of them is called the Tomcat Serenade. 
and it's also signed Elaw, and next to it somebody has penciled in Hale. Uh, let's see, it's on page 148, which I'm going to access here very gently. Here it is, the Tomcat Serenade. Once again, underneath Elaw, someone has written in, looks like a female writing to me, but anyway, written in Hale. And this is Matthew Style, absolutely. He's written two other pieces on this same topic about Tomcats yowling uh, at night. Matthew had insomnia and he uh, you know, really had a problem with Tomcats. Um, but I know Matthew's style and between the style and the subject, I know this is Matthew Franklin Whittier's work. I'll read a little bit of it. And this, near as I can tell, Hale didn't write anything else like this, see, whereas this is exactly Matthew's. It is the hour, the dewy hour, of fading light and folded flower, and night and love and beauty's power. Meow. Sweet tabby, from thy garret high, I pray thee send a loving eye, and hear thy faithful Tommy sigh. Meow. Now next to these, this apparently was a style, which I'm really not familiar with, there's notes out in the margin that summarize what's being said in each stanza. See this? I don't know where or where this was used or how it got started. But in front of the first part, it says, the cat discourseth of the night, and then underneath, and prayeth for his mistress's favor. You know, and it goes on like that. Now sleeps the moonlight on the hill. The winds are hushed. The waves are still. All silent, save the bubbling rill. Meow. Oh, come with me across the street, and I will spread a noble treat of all that tabbies love to eat. Meow. And then next to that it says, the cat inviteth his mistress to a banquet. This is Matthew's humor. Oh, bid me not alone depart. I feel the burning teardrop start. Oh, speak and heal a bursting heart. Meow, says the cat, pleadeth his sufferings. And then, and we will have a cozy chat. For I've a splendid haunch of rat, just cooked to suit a lady cat. Meow, says, and describeth his treat. Well, it goes on. It's excellent. And it's typical for Matthew Franklin Whittier. So I was immediately put on notice. I said, oh my gosh, that's Matthew. So then there's another one here. Now there's a whole bunch of poems by Elah or Edward Everett Hale. And the gist of them before I found out that that's who it was, the gist of him is it's like a Don Juan with a harem. You know, there he is in Harvard, and he's got all these ladies, and he can't decide between the two of them. And this one has a beautiful eyes, and this one has beautiful lips. And, you know, it's written like a guy that's like a king with his harem, right? Well, then I found out he's 13 or 14. So he's the mascot with all of these girls kind of, you know, fondly patting him on the head. He doesn't have a chance with any of them, but he imagines, see, that he's like the king with the harem. Well, that's Edward Everett Hale at 14. I'll tell you, I looked at his photograph or his, yeah, his photograph, and I really disliked this guy. He became a minister later on in life, but emotionally, I have a strong reaction to this guy. I don't like him, <laughs> you know? So that apparently there was no love lost between these two. If I, and, and that that kind of intuition and rec recognition memory has been proven accurate in my study before. So I take it with a certain degree of credibility. Now, to Adela, there are two names that Matthew used when, when writing about Abby. You know, and when I say that, I mean in such a way that her, she, her identity was disguised. He would give her the name Adeline or Adela, or he would give her the name more often was Juliana or Julia. Now, these may have been generic to some extent. I've seen other things about Julia as kind of a generic name. But I did have the strong feeling from Abby or from past life memory, I can't always tell which, that, uh, that Abby didn't like her name and that she kind of felt maybe that she worried that she might have been adopted because she didn't really fit in her family and that she didn't like her name. She was named after the local doctor's wife, Abigail Weld. So her given name was Abigail Weld Poyen. And then she changed it. By the time she got married, you see that she's Abigail Rochemont Poyen, which is part of her father's extended French family name. So apparently she didn't like Weld. 
she didn't like Abigail, I feel. And I also found out that an Abigail is a, a British nursemaid. Okay, that's that was like slang. So at any rate, I think she or I felt from her that she tried on other names that she liked better. She, you know, it's hard to get anybody else to call you by a new name. But she for herself kind of tried on these names so that when Matthew would write about her in a veiled reference, he would give her one of her favorite names, either Juliana or Adele or Adeline. Well, that's not proof, but it's consistent with him having written to her as Adela here. This was when she was a teenager. See? So um, if I understand correctly, this would have been written when she was 16 and he was 20. 16 was the earliest that one could appropriately become physical with the girl that one loved. Um, when I say physical, not necessarily sex, but, you know, more than just hand-holding and walking around and talking, see? You could, and you could actually uh, kiss the girl or whatever. So I'm trying to be appropriate here. But this appears to be Matthew's poem to Abby, asking her, now that she's 16, would she please consent to being more physically intimate. It's a beautiful poem, but more importantly, it doesn't fit anything that Edward Everett Hale was writing, because this is a poem by somebody who's monogamous, who's really in love with one girl and wants to be, you know, intimate with her. It's not written in um, imitation of, like, it's not written as a seduction, in other words. It's written as somebody who's sincerely in love with a girl and just one. So it's not a match, content-wise, for Edward Edward Hale. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to read it, to be perfectly honest. I, I don't know the... Well, I guess I will. I mean, I don't really like to share intimate things with, with people who are hatefully skeptic. I don't mind skeptics at all. And I don't mind a little sincere ridicule if somebody's really deeply convinced after having studied, they're convinced that, no, this guy isn't genuine, you know, and they're convinced that I'm imagining or putting on something. And so if they really sincerely believe that I'm a hypocrite, then it's appropriate for them to ridicule hypocrisy. On the other hand, there's that, that is mimicked by people who actually are being egotistical and being stubborn and are aggressively and hatefully ridiculing, they pretend to themselves that they're the first kind. You know, the ones that love truth and have determined that somebody's a hypocrite and hypocrisy deserves to be ridiculed, they imagine and pretend and rationalize to themselves that they're the first type, but they're actually not. They're a knockoff, you know? They're a dark knockoff of that. And they are ridiculing from the ego and not from any love of truth. It's, it's not really understood in society, the distinction between these two things, and they're totally different, you know. Um, anyway, I will read it. To Adela, lady by the stars that glisten in yon conscious arch above, by the viewless forms that listen to my plighted vow of love, by this heart which fondly flingeth all its incense on thy shrine. Speak the word that rapture bringeth. Whisper, dearest, thou art mine. O oh, delay not, bitter sorrow, for thy coyness have I borne. Let me not another morrow feel within the festering thorn. Ah, that gentle smile thou wearest speaks a pity for my pain. Bless thee, bless thee, sweetest, dearest, let me see that smile again. Lady, do those witching glances and that bosom's gentle swell and the soft blush that entrances sign a joy words cannot tell? Speak they not the first of blisses, first on earth and first above? Seal the holy bond with kisses, holy for the bond is love. That's not written by a Don Juan pretending to be in love with a girl. That's not Edward Everett Hale. That's Matthew Franklin Whittier sincerely writing to Abby, who's just turned 16, hoping that she will allow them to become a romantic couple and not just friends. 
or not just friends hoping to be a romantic couple someday, which is what they've been for at least a year. Notice in this, the first stanza, it opens, Lady, by the stars that glisten in yon conscious arch above. That's a very deliberate reference because Abby believed that the stars were conscious and she wrote a poem to that effect. I won't go back and read it here. It would be nice to show all the connections, but we don't have enough time to show all these connections. Abby wrote a poem called Part of an Address to the Stars. That's the way it was published, in which she says that the stars are conscious beings. And this is Matthew's reference to that. He is, instead of being cynical and, and critical, he's now accepting that. And then he says, by the viewless forms that listen to my plighted vow of love. That's an admission of spiritualism. Okay, so he is now accepting the things that she's been trying to teach him. Now, whether he did that sincerely or not, I think he did. I think at this point he was sincerely accepting these things that she had taught him and trying to show her that, yes, he was a spiritual person because see, she would not marry a man who wasn't spiritual. So that was kind of an issue between them. She was kind of waiting for him to come around, I think. Well, he's come around, see? So that's, I would say that's definitely Matthew Franklin Whittier. So I'm going to put this, let's see, over here where it'll be safe. It's kind of fragile. And let's go on to the next one. Um, let's see. There we go. Now you can see my database and you can also see that I'm closing my eyes. All right. What have I gotten myself into, so to speak? Large digital books. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's get out of this because it's a little bit hard to. Uh, this is one of the folders where I put the actual PDFs of the whole thing in here. So I don't think I want to do that one. I'm going to go again. I'm closing my eyes and I've gotten the spirit of the times. Once again, I've gotten one that only has one entry. Well, so be it. So let's get into that. There's only one and it's still possible. It's an asterisk from January 6th, 1845. The Spirit of the Times. Now, that's a paper that I believe Matthew's plagiarist, Charles Burnham, used to publish Matthew's pieces in quite frequently. So uh, Matthew did not publish it. I think it was conservative, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I've talked about this before, how George P. Burnham with his partner, Francis A. Duravage, apparently tricked Matthew into signing a bogus contract, which gave them absolute, complete rights to publish anything out of Matthew's portfolio of unpublished work. And they proceeded to publish the entire darn portfolio, including pieces that Matthew had no intention of ever publishing, which were from very early on. And they were, you know, some of Matthew's earliest work was racist by our standards until he stopped doing that. And uh, some of it was just practice sketches. You know, like an artist would go out on the streets and sketch things as practice. You know, that was what Matthew was doing with real life anecdotes. He had no intention of publishing a lot of that stuff. They published every scrap as near as I can tell. So Matthew, for some reason, published one little piece or somebody found it somewhere and republished it in this in this publication, The Spirit of the Times. Uh, but it is, I would say, his because first off, it's, an, it's a humorous anecdote just like the kind that uh, Charles P. Burnham was publishing under his pseudonym, The Youngin. And uh, it's signed with an asterisk. I would say this is definitely Matthews. Again, it may not have originated with the spirit of the times. It could have been published somewhere else. So let's read it. A match for Haynes. A good anecdote is told in The Last True American of a man named Bentley, a most confirmed drunkard who would never drink with a friend or in public and always bitterly denied when caught a little too, too steep, that may be T-O-O, steep, ever tasting liquor. One day, some bad witnesses concealed themselves in his room, 
and when the liquor was running down his throat, seized him with his arm crooked and his mouth open, and holding him fast, asked him with an air of triumph, Ah, Bentley, we have caught you at last. You never drink, huh? Now one would have supposed that Bentley would have acknowledged the corn. Not he. With the most grave and expressible face, he calmly and in a dignified manner said, Gentlemen, my name is not Bentley. So this would be absolutely typical for Matthew. The gist of it is trying to prove to someone their own hypocrisy and the, the, the extent to which someone will go into denial when shown proof. This, remember, I have the same higher mind that Matthew Franklin Whittier had. This penchant for exposing hypocrisy and the frustration at the human capacity for denial is part of Matthew's higher mind, and it's part of mine. It hasn't changed. It's the same person talking to you today on that level. And I express the same frustration with regard to this work that I can literally, I can publish and have published a paper, 52-page paper, with abundant evidence that Edgar Allan Poe stole the raven from Matthew Franklin Whittier. And what happens? They refuse to read it. They tell themselves, oh, this is bunkum, and they refuse to read the paper, or they pretend like they've read the paper and ridicule me. See, it's the same dynamic psychologically as this guy saying, oh, my name's not Bentley. In other words, when pushed to the wall, the person in denial will find some totally irrational, ridiculous way to squeeze out of the picture, see? Well, you know, that was definitely Matthew. Now, why he showed up in the spirit of the times, I don't know. All right, well, let's go back. Let's see. There we go. I apologize for my uh, unfamiliarity with this system here. It's the old story that by the time you finally figure it out, you won't be doing it anymore, you know. All right, well, let's do another one. That's Harvardian again. That's no good. Bay State Monthly. All right, that only has one option, but we'll look at it. By the way, the fact that I get the wrong ones, I don't really mean to or want to choose the ones that only have one entry, you know, but this will show you that I'm really doing it. I don't know how else to prove to you that I'm really doing this randomly. This was published after Matthew died. It's the last piece of Matthew's that I know of, and he died in January of 1883. This was published in two different publications, actually, but, but here we have it in uh, the Granite Monthly in July of 1884, and it's signed Frank P. Harriman. Now, uh, I've gone over this before. The gist of it is that they decide to visit um, Dungeon Rock in uh, a park in Lynn, Massachusetts. But the gist is that they go visit this Dungeon Rock, and Dungeon Rock was connected with spiritualism. It was a couple guys. Let me go ahead and get out of this for a minute. It was a family who had gotten the idea that pirates had buried this treasure very deep into this granite outcropping. And for more than one generation, they searched for the treasure, supposedly getting... Um, clues and directions from the spirit of the pirates, and they never found it. So this huge wasted effort that went on for, like I said, a couple generations. Matthew, by this time, I think, was beginning to become skeptical about spiritualism. He had uh, married a woman that was just uh, taking advantage of him, was like totally practical, and he uh, was in a dead-end job. He'd had to take an office, which he philosophically was against. He'd been forced to take an office because he was getting shunned after he was exposed as the author of Ethan Spike. And he was in this dead-end job and he started drinking again. I think he fell in with author Bret Hart, although I can't prove it, and started drinking again. So, uh, you know, he was kind of in a bad way, except my under hypnosis, what I remembered is during the last two or three years, he got involved with a metaphysical group, a small metaphysical group. And that 
leader of that group got him into something like AA. That's what I remembered under hypnosis. There was actually a group like AA called the Washington Washingtonians, and he may have gotten involved with them. He'd been a temperance man for many years, so apparently he got back on the wagon and uh, and got sober the last few years, but I think his stomach was ruined by that time and he died of an ulcer, I believe. Anyway, um, long story short, during the first year or so of my research, there was a researcher that helped me out on a volunteer basis. She was skeptical, but uh, she did a pretty good job. And she would send me things that she found about Matthew in such a way as to test me to see what my reaction would be. And then we'd see if my reaction fit with the historical record. So I was trying to prove that it was genuine. I wasn't sure at that point. So she sent me a list that came from a book called The Real Diary of a Real Boy, which probably wasn't either. But at any rate, in, in this supposed diary of a boy, the boy visits the Boston Custom House and meets the people working there in the Naval Department, I think it was, and one of them is Matthew. So he describes meeting Matthew, and there's a list of all of the men that were working in the department at that time, or many of them. So she sent me that list, just the list, and my job was to look through and see if I got any hits, any feelings of recognition. Well, I strongly got a hit on Frank Harriman. I said, I know him. He was a friend. I get a, uh, you know, a, kind of a blip on the radar screen or, a, you know, a, a beep on the Geiger counter on that one. And then some months later, she sent me the same list and I'd forgotten, at least consciously, I'd forgotten that I'd seen it. And I had the same impression. I said, oh, Frank Harriman, you know, and then wait a minute, didn't you send me that list before, you know? So I had reacted to Frank Harriman. Then I found his picture, which I'll put up on the screen here when I'm editing, much later, connected with Find a Grave. And of course, I knew who it was supposed to be. So I can't say that this is any kind of evidence because I already had prior knowledge. But I had a strong, strong hit on this, you know, emotional hit of recognition on this guy's portrait. So what I remembered was, because I got a little bit of intellectual information along with that emotional hit, which sometimes happened. It kind of sneaks in with the emotion. And what I remembered is that when I was sick, this guy who was somewhat younger would take me around to specialists, you know? Um, so that's what I think they were doing at Dungeon Rock in uh, Lynn Woods, I think it's called. They, he was apparently taking him to a specialist. Well, in the historical record, Matthew did convalesce in Lynn around about the right time. I think it was maybe 1880 when he was sick. So uh, there's a lot of clues that, that support this. And there's a passage in this, which I recognized immediately as Matthew's humor. Even when I wasn't prepared to say that Matthew wrote it, I thought, well, Frank Harriman must have borrowed from Matthew's sense of humor and wrote like him. No, this is Matthew's work. And now I know it is, and I can show you why I think it is. So we're going to switch over. Okay, I had to dip to black for a minute because I couldn't get the piece on my screen. So now I do have it on the screen and I'm going to switch over. So uh, here you have Dungeon Rock in Lynn. And uh, of course, there's the date and so on in the page. It's signed Frank Harriman. What's happened is that Matthew, before he died, he, he had gone out on this trip. He'd written it up and he just handed it to Frank Harriman and said, you know, just go ahead. Uh, just go ahead and use your own name and publish it yourself as a thank you, I think, for having taken him around. So uh, it talks about how they got there. And it talks about how it had been a spiritualist Mecca and a little bit of the history. Quite a bit of the history. Talks about going down into the into the uh, cave. I went to this place myself and I got to the entrance. I'll show you some photographs of it. It's in my second book, my sequel. And I was too scared to go in. I was all by myself. I only had two little flashlights and I had a coat so I wouldn't be cold, but it was, it was black in there. There was no light and it was wet. And there was things, at least they showed up in my cell phone that were flying around in there. And like I said, there was no one within earshot. And I thought, you know, if I slipped and broke a leg or something, I die in there, you know, there's nobody would ever find me. So I said, I don't think so. So I didn't go down in it, but I did go to the entrance. And 
the reaction I had was fear that this is a pretty scary place. Matthew with Frank went down all the way to the bottom, like 150 feet down, but it was, it was lighted and there were people around the entrance. But I think that if that was partly past life emotion, I think I was way more scared than I let on, put it that way. Here, he talks about going down in it, the rough hewn passage. But before he gets there, there's a couple indications of Matthew's humor. Okay, here we are. He says, uh, we should have said before that this is considered a kind of Mecca for those who hold to the spiritual faith. There are several buildings which seem to have been dropped down without much order and a large platform furnished with plank seats. All of that's gone now. And entertainment had been furnished, though for what purpose or by whom we knew not. There was some fine singing in solos, duets, and quartets, and a slender little girl showed a good lip, large lungs, and nimble fingers on a silver cornet, out of which she fired repeated volleys of sputtering jigs at the over-elated spectators. That's a gag that Matthew has brought back from three prior instances, okay? So I know that's Matthew writing because he's bringing back a gag that he particularly liked. I won't cite them all. I've done that elsewhere. Then there's a thing in here about the pirates' wives. Let's see if I can find it. This is what struck me when I first saw it. it says, in one of the buildings named above, there are several portraits of pirates and their wives, drawn, it is said, by someone under the influence of the spirits in a marvelously short space of time. Several wives of Captain Kidd are among them. Captain Kidd must have been a remarkable man to want more than one such character for a companion, provided the likenesses are true to nature. At any rate, we are not at all surprised that he was a pirate under the circumstances. <laughs> that is classic Matthew Franklin Whittier humor. So I'm absolutely certain that Frank Harriman was not the original author of that piece. Now, um, let's try one more because I'm really not hitting on the kinds of things that I want to, sadly. Um, let's see, we're going to, okay, I had to make some adjustments again. I still haven't totally figured this out. My apologies. Anyway, um, I believe it is now working. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet here and I'm going to scroll through these again with my eyes closed. All right, that's useless, so we're not going to use that one. I'm going to try again. All right, here we're in the New York Tribune, and this is all of the work that's attributed to Margaret Fuller, but which is actually Matthews. So uh, let's see what we get here. Proofread or formatted. Now I'm in this database from the New York Tribune of the fall of 1844 until mid-1846. All of this has been attributed to Margaret Fuller with one or two exceptions. I'm going to pick randomly and let's see what we come up with. Here we have the 4th of July. There, now you can see it. Apparently, I have to switch these things manually now. I don't know why I should have to do that. But we have the 4th of July, uh, published on July 4, 1845. I will scroll down. You see that it's signed with an asterisk. I even made the asterisk a little oversized, which is the way they appear. I probably have a physical copy of this, although it's not really necessary to go dig it out now. What can I find here that would indicate that this is Matthew's writing? The problem with Margaret Fuller is that she's supposed to be a transcendentalist. She's supposed to be a mystic. And then along with that, she's supposed to be uh, philanthropically inclined and, and uh, interested in social reform and all those things. In other words, she's supposed to be all the things that Matthew really is. So this is not just somebody claiming Matthew's work. This is someone pretending to be what Matthew is. 
which is to say Matthew is a real transcendentalist, whereas she is a kind of a phony. And when I say a phony, what apparently happened is that, you know, Little League Syndrome, where the, the father so much wants the boy to be a baseball star that he pushes him into it, that seems to have happened on the intellectual level with Margaret Fuller. Her father kind of did a Pygmalion number on her and tried to turn her into a child prodigy and a genius. And she was smart and she played the role, but she was never really the kind of actual child prodigy that Matthew Franklin Whittier was. So this imitation goes far deeper than just somebody adopting a pseudonym. It was kind of an existential imitation. So the gist of that is it's very difficult to pick out the two. You, you almost have to do which, what I did was to look for masculine references, you know, personal autobiographical offhand references, things that would preclude a woman, you know, or would preclude uh, Fuller and point towards Matthew. And I did find a few of these little teensy weensy smoking guns. I don't know that there's one in here. I can read a little bit of it, and if something strikes me, I will, I will mention it. The bells ring. The cannon rouse the echoes along the river shore. The boys sally forth with shouts and little flags and crackers enough to frighten all the people they meet from sunrise to sunset. The orator is conning for the last time the speech in which he has vainly attempted to season with some new spice the yearly panegyric upon our country, its happiness and glory. The audience is putting on its best bib and tucker and its blandest expression to listen. Now, I don't know about Margaret Fuller, but Matthew was raised Quaker. Apparently, the Quakers were not big on nationalism. They really didn't worship country. Matthew kind of keeps a low profile on that, but he's not impressed with the country. He makes fun of patriotism and nationalism. And uh, they, I think the Quakers taught that it was vanity, the, the worship of country and the love of country, and that Matthew grew up with that. So you will see little references to this here and there where Matthew is quite jaded about great expressions of patriotism. It's seen very clearly in his uh, Ensign Stebbings character in the uh, Boston Carpetbag in 1851-52, except that the editor, Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber, in his memoirs, incorrectly attributed that to Benjamin Drew for whatever reason. But uh, we see it here. Let's go on. And yet, no heart, we think, can beat today with one pulse of genuine, noble joy. Those who have obtained their selfish objects will not take a special pleasure in thinking of them today, while to unbiased minds must come sad thoughts of national honor soiled in the eyes of other nations of a great inheritance risked if not forfeited so what he's talking about here is slavery that whatever our glory that we're celebrating on the fourth of july may be we have forfeited it basically by embracing slavery i don't know that margaret fuller really believed those things you know but matthew's very clearly he's kind of going around a, a you know, beaten around the bush, but that's what he's saying. Much has been achieved in this country since the first Declaration of Independence. America is rich and strong. She has shown great talent and energy, vast prospects of aggrandizement open before her. But the noble sentiment which she expressed in her early youth is tarnished. She has shown that righteousness is not her chief desire, and her name is no longer a watchword for the highest hopes to the rest of the world. She knows this, but takes it very easily. She feels that she is growing richer and more powerful, and that seems to suffice her. These facts are deeply saddening to those who can pronounce the words, my country, with pride and peace, only so far as steadfast virtues, generous impulses, find their home in that country, speaking of himself. They cannot be satisfied with superficial benefits, with luxuries, and the means of obtaining knowledge which are multiplied for them. They could rejoice in full hands and a busy brain if the soul were expanding and the heart pure, but the higher conditions being violated, what is done cannot be done for good. Such thoughts shadow patriot minds as the cannon peal bursts upon the ear. This year, which declares that the people at large consent to cherish and extend slavery as one of our, quote, domestic institutions, takes from the patriot his home. 
This year, which attests their insatiate love of wealth and power, quenches the flame upon the altar. So I was right. This is Matthew the abolitionist, and he is an abolitionist at this point, deeply involved in the abolitionist movement underground. Yet there remains that good part which cannot be taken away. If nations go astray, the narrow path may always be found and followed by the individual man, like himself. It is hard, hard indeed, when politics and trade are mixed up with evils so mighty that he scarcely dares touch them for fear of being defiled. What Matthew's saying here, he's a merchant, or in past years he has been a merchant. He's saying that it's almost impossible to achieve what Buddha would call right livelihood, because as soon as you get into trade, you find that you are supposed to laugh at racist jokes, for example, just a small example. You find that you're supposed to support the cotton industry, you know, and the slavery industry. In other words, it's almost impossible to get involved in mercantile pursuits without soiling yourself with the evil of slavery. He says he cannot enjoy the free use of his limbs, glowing upon a favorable tide, but struggling, panting, must fix his eyes upon his aim and fight against the current to reach it. It is not easy. It is very hard just now to realize the blessings of independence. And again, Matthew's telling us that being honest and being virtuous, he found it extremely difficult to compete in the world of mercantile pursuits. For what is independence if it does not lead to freedom? Freedom from fraud and meanness, from selfishness, from public opinion, so far as it does not consent with the still small voice of one's better self. Now, Abby had written a beautiful poem about the still small voice. He is a Christian, and uh, Margaret Fuller kind of gave lip service to being a Christian, but I don't think she really was, so she would not have made that reference. Yet there is still a great and worthy part to play. This country presents great temptations to ill, but also great inducements to good, and so on. Maybe I won't continue. You get the idea. What's happened is, I'm going to switch over. What's happened is that uh, historians, assuming that Margaret Fuller wrote all this, reads pieces like this, sees the philosophy behind it, and the messages that are embedded in it, and attributes them to Margaret Fuller, and now they have built Margaret Fuller into a character that she was not actually, see? So it, it kind of is self-creating, you know? Once you accept the fact that Margaret Fuller wrote these, then suddenly you start attributing all of these beautiful thoughts to her, and now she's that person to you. So trying to tell anybody that she was actually an egotistical phony who appropriated Matthew's uh, signature because, see, he was, he was a freelancer. He was freelancing for the Tribune, but he was kind of seen as a ghostwriter. And a ghostwriter has no rights. See, if you perceive him that way, he has no rights. You can go in and modify his work because it's yours. He's being paid for it. He's a ghostwriter. You can do anything you want to because you own it. See, that's the attitude that Margaret Fuller apparently had to Matthew's writing as the star. But this had been his signature since 1829. It was his signature in other papers immediately after he left the Tribune and even a little before. In the Odd Fellow, in the transcript, in the chronotype, the Portland transcript, this was Matthew's signature all the way up to 1875. And it had a deep significance for him. So she had the right to edit his work. She didn't have the right to go in and write whole paragraphs as though they were his. She didn't have the right to claim his signature, which he'd been using since 1829. She didn't have the right to go overseas and write as that signature, any more than Henry Ward Beecher had the right to take it up and start writing from Europe as the star for the independent as soon as she died, like a week or two after she died, see? Neither of these people had any right to appropriate that signature. So uh, this is a serious theft, and I think it's one of the ones that galled Matthew the most because his satire of Margaret Fuller is the most biting of any of them. With Edgar Allan Poe, he tried to forgive and he tried to understand based on his bad childhood, you know, his you know unpleasant childhood, and kind of left us very strong hints. But with Margaret Fuller, he went flat out and just blasted her with every sarcastic bone in his body, see? So he must have he must have really felt that Margaret Fuller 
having had a privileged childhood, had absolutely no right to do what she did. So uh, let's see. Shall we do any more? Let's try one more. I'm going to have to do a lot of editing on this because of my mistakes. I'm not editing out anything that's, you know, evidential, but what I'm editing out is where I couldn't figure out how to use the software. All right, I'm going to go through my database again. I'm going to close my eyes and let's see what we get this time. All right, I'm in the Boston carpet bag. Now we're in familiar territory. And uh, again, I'm going to scroll through these and let's see what comes up. All right, this is the one I picked. It's called The Origin of Puffing. Now I'm going to show a few, uh, a few things here. Let's see. I'm going to go and get the, uh, the Perils of Pearl Street. So I'll be right back. I don't have an antiquarian copy of this. All right. Here we have the Perils of Pearl Street. This is a reproduction. If you want to buy an original, right now it's come down to $1,200. That's a long story. Some of them are like $1,600. No, some of them are $6,500, actually. But there's one for sale for $1,200. So it's a bargain. I think the reason they went up so high is this is actually supposed to be the first instance of somebody writing about the financial world of New York City. And therefore, people who are like stockbrokers would be interested in having that in their collection. These people have more money than they know what to do with. And therefore, two of these stockbrokers must have bid against each other and bid the thing up. And then, all of a sudden, everybody that owns anything that's supposed to be by Asa Green thinks it's worth thousands of dollars. Well, it was only worth thousands of dollars to those two guys. <laughs> and they've got their copies. So now, none of these other ones ever sell. Meanwhile, a book that I should be able to buy for 30 or 40 or 50 dollars is like $1,200. So I'll probably, unless I get rich, I'll never have a copy of that. But this is supposed to be written by Asa Green, who was Matthew's editor on the New York Constellation. Uh, Matthew edited that paper actually for Asa Green, as I've shown, from like 1830 until 1832, when he left because of the cholera epidemic. Uh, the, um, the humor is absolutely typical of Matthew in, in this, and Matthew was pursuing a mercantile career. If you look at the um, the memoirs of Joseph T. Buckingham, Matthew's editor on one of the, uh, the very first paper that he ever submitted to, I think, the New England Galaxy in Boston, you will find that in 1852, when uh, Buckingham wrote his memoirs, he talked about Matthew as Moses Whitney. He just changed his name up a little bit. And he said that he was pursuing a mercantile career as well as writing for the paper. That was Matthew Franklin Whittier. This is Matthew Frank, Franklin Whittier drawing on his experiences in that world. It was not Asa Green who ran a bookstore and really didn't know that world intimately. So I'm going to read chapter 8, or a little portion of chapter 8 in The Perils of Pearl Street before we get to this piece in the carpet bag about puffing. Being a brief essay on the art of drumming. Drumming is high pressure sales. Though much of the apparent business of my employers was mere empty show, nevertheless it must be owned that they got off a considerable quantity of goods, which they did chiefly by dint of drumming, for, as I said before, they boarded their numerous clerks as well as themselves at the different hotels in the city for this very purpose. As I have mentioned the practice of drumming, it will doubtless be necessary for the better understanding of my readers, especially those in the country, to define what is meant by the use of the term. He's writing cautionary tales, by the way. I well recollect, and indeed have already spoken of, my own ignorance on the subject when I first came to the city. This is Matthew's favorite topic. And I take it to be no disparagement to my country readers in general, just to suppose they are as little acquainted with the matter as I myself was at that time. So he's writing to try to warn people like himself that come to the, from the country to the big city. Drumming, in mercantile phrase, means the soliciting of customers. 
It is chiefly used in reference to country merchants or those supposed to be such. Instead of patiently waiting for these persons to come and purchase, the merchant or his clerk goes to them and solicits their custom. In this manner, the sale of goods is often expedited. And he goes on about high-pressure sales and how, how he couldn't do it because uh, he was too honest. You know, they would ask him how good the material was or the merchandise was, and he would say, well, it's pretty good, you know. So he was too honest for high-pressure sales. That's the gist of this, and I don't want to um, go on at too much length of reading things. But let's go back now to this piece in the carpet bag, the origin of puffing. So puffing means advertising, means dishonestly puffing up one's product or oneself. So this is Matthew. Let's see, is it signed? It's signed with a one-off pseudonym, Parvus Iulus. I don't know what that means. I don't know what the reference is. I'm sure it's a meaningful reference to probably a historical character. If I can find it, I will put it up on the screen. But that would be typical of Matthew to take somebody that he studied. You know, Abby was teaching him all about ancient Greece and the ancient world and the philosophers of the ancient world. And he would occasionally take the things in her curriculum and use them for pseudonyms. Well, this, of course, is like 10 years after she had passed on, but he still was familiar with these things and he would use them in his humorous works occasionally. So I think that's what he's done here. Um, so we read, puffs grow in any soil. And by puffs, I do not mean that kind of puff defined by Webster as a quote, sudden, so it should be short, and sudden and short blast of wind, but the other and more common sort called by a lexicographer, quote, a tumid or exaggerated statement or commendation. This kind of puffs, having had an early origin, have spread all over the earth and are familiar to all the inhabitants thereof. They have become so common that it may with truth be said, if puffs were horses, beggars might ride. The very air is rife with puffs. All, from the great schoolmaster of the borough to the powerless king on a throne, do homage at thy altar, O soul-inspiring puff. No book is printed or newspaper started without thy powerful aid. Presidents have been made, and, as the prospects are, will be made again by the all-conquering influence of thy trumpet blasts. Sarsaparilla compounders have become rich, and one celebrated pillmaker has been wafted on thy favoring breezes into a senatorial seat. Well, you get the gist. This is Matthew, raised Quaker, still expressing his Quaker values uh, about dishonest hype, which I feel exactly the same way about today. I felt exactly the same way about that all my life before I ever found Matthew. That is because that is part of the higher mind. That's an attitude of value, uh, deeper intuition that continues right on from one lifetime to another. I have a million of these comparisons. I could show you point for point for point for point for point for point that I have the same higher mind that Matthew Franklin Whittier had. It hasn't changed. That mind doesn't die and it isn't born. It just continues right on. It's accessed. It's not part of the physical brain. So I think that's enough to give you an idea of how all these things tie together, but also how vast this thing is. Um, <clears throat> let me see. So here we have my database again. I'm right now in the Boston carpet bag. I'm coming out. Um, the ones that Matthew contributed to regularly, where he had... Um, where he had a relationship with the editors, was the Berkshire American. That was Asa Green's first paper in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. We're talking 1826 or something like that. The carpet bag he was uh, heavily invested in financially, as well as being personal friends and a collaborator with the editor, Benjamin Penhallow Schilber. The Boston Chronotype, that was edited by Elijah Wright, starting in the 1840s, mid-1840s. And Matthew was close friends with him. Uh, Elijah Wright was a radical abolitionist. He was friends with both of the Whittier brothers. That was the one paper that Matthew could write as sarcastically and as radically as he wanted to. I compare him to Lee Camp in that paper. 
the Boston Courier was just Joseph T. Buckingham's um, other paper, his daily that he owned along with the New England Galaxy. And I think that Matthew probably worked as a printer's apprentice for that paper. Uh, the Boston Literary Museum became the Boston Weekly Museum in mid-1848. Matthew wrote heavily for that paper. He's on in the very first edition on the front page, and he continues to be a heavy contributor. Unfortunately, the editor's editorship switched hands so that uh, the editor that came in, Charles A.B. Putnam, was conservative and a, ra a racist, at least a closet racist. And Matthew had a very uh, difficult relationship with him. Let's see. The others are just kind of one-offs here. The Daily Delta. I've said that uh, Matthew, for three summers in 1846, after he left the Tr New York Tribune, 1847, and briefly in 1848, he was down in New Orleans writing for the Daily Delta. He was undercover as a uh, liaison for William Lloyd Garrison, I believe. Um, at the very least, Elijah Wright gives some evidence of knowing that he's undercover, but not knowing if he's okay, so they weren't in direct contact. But uh, there's one little bit in the chronotype where Elijah Wright refers to Ethan Spike. He's actually referring to Matthew. This is before Ethan Spike was known. And he says he hopes he's still alive. You know, well, that was not a joke. It was literal. He hoped he was still alive. He said that like a wood duck that goes down, he pops up again somewhere else. And so hopefully he's okay. The Dover Inquirer, Matthew and Abby eloped to Dover, New Hampshire from Haverhill, Massachusetts. Um, when they got married in 1836, they lived for a year and a half in Dover, and they wrote a series of very hard-hitting pro-abolition letters to the editor and then got driven out of town. Um, the flag of our union, Matthew didn't write for that, but Matthew's plagiarists, um, Francis Duravage and George Burnham, when they stole the rights to Matthew's portfolio, tricked him out of the rights to his portfolio, they published a whole bunch of his work under the pseudonyms of the Olden, which was one of Matthew's favorite phrases, and the Youngen, respectively. Uh, they published a, a massive amount of Matthew's portfolio in that newspaper uh, starting in 1849. Gleason's pictorial, likewise, uh, Francis Duravage became... Uh, when it switched over from Gleason's pictorial to Ballou's pictorial, and, and I think it was um, Martin Ballou, I can't remember. When he took it over, uh, Francis Duravage became an associate editor on the strength of all the stuff that he'd stolen out of Matthew's portfolio. And quite a bit of Matthew's work, including one complete novel, got published in there. Matthew didn't publish in there himself. Um, let's see... I'm just looking for the ones that had a, a lot of Matthew's work in it. New England Galaxy, that was edited by Joseph D. Buckingham in the 1820s. Matthew, as a boy, began submitting to that. It was a major literary journal in Boston. He began getting published as early as age 12 in 1825, and he moved there and, and worked for Buckingham, and I think Buckingham became a mentor, you know, a surrogate father for him. Likewise, New England Galaxy, that was edited by the same fellow a little later on in the early 1830s, like 1831, 32. And Matthew contributed fairly much to that. The New York Constellation, um, this is Asa Green's second paper in New York City. Matthew edited that after, I don't know how long it took him to become the editor, but by mid-1830, he was editing that paper and uh, Asa Green was managing his bookstore. The New York Inquirer was uh, Mordecai Noah. In New York early on, that's uh, Joe Strickland appeared in there. New York Transcript, that's Asa Green's third newspaper in the mid 1830s. Matthew wrote the uh, he wrote the police office, the arraignment hearings, which was one of the lowliest jobs on the paper. Presumably, he was pursuing his mercantile career, and I don't think he edited the transcript, but he was heavily involved in it, and he made of those arraignment hearing reports. The blotter he made of them real literature you know pathos and black humor and morality you know moral tales he did the same thing many years later for the daily delta the new york tribune that's all of the work that's officially attributed to margaret fuller which 98 percent of it or so was matthew's work which i've just we've just looked at um let's see 
Portland Transcript, Matthew wrote, Matthew wrote for the Portland Transcript from about 1838 until 1875, off and on. Uh, first of all, he was writing for his personal friend, Charles P. Isley, and then it switched over to Edward Elwell. Well, Matthew continued to write for the Portland Transcript for many years, including as the star. Um, Salisbury Monitor is Matthew's own paper. There's only one volume of it existing in the world that I know of, and whoever purchased it back in 2012 or whenever it was, paid about $7,000 for it, plus a little something else from John Greenleaf Whittier, and has squirreled it away, and you can't find a copy of it anywhere. He hasn't shared it with the world, which I believe is unethical. I believe that you can own physical objects, but you cannot own history. Uh, but this person apparently believes otherwise. He has to, can't be an institution. It has to be a private individual because no institution would pay $7,000 for it. It has to be somebody that has a particular interest in the Whittier legacy, I would think. Um, but they have not seen fit to share it with the world. I suspect it contains evidence like a precursor of a Christmas carol or something like that that shows, you know, that uh, that Matthew and Abby were the real authors. Something is in there that is a little bit disturbing. And just like the giant skeletons that the Smithsonian has suppressed, I think somebody's holding on to it because it would be unpleasant if it was let out. Um, Stray Subjects, that's Francis Duravage compilation, but it's all almost all Matthew's work. Moving down, the Odd Fellow, that's the Odd Fellows organization in Boston, that's their newspaper. Matthew wrote as the star for that organization, even a little bit before he left the New York Tribune writing as the star. Vanity Fair, Matthew wrote for Vanity Fair in 1862 and 1863, with one exception that was all Ethan Spike, and uh, that was a conservative newspaper. For some reason, he'd gotten on with them and uh, wrote one. Most of it was politically neutral, but the second one, I believe it was, was an open letter to uh, President Lincoln. It was critical of Lincoln, which may be why they published it, but it was critical of him from the left. You know, if Lee Camp criticizes Joe Biden, that's a whole different story than if Fox News criticizes Joe Biden. You know, well, that's the way Matthew was in Vanity Fair criticizing Abe Lincoln. He was pressing Lincoln to emancipate the slaves, which Lincoln was reluctant to do. And he was also pressing them to allow black men to fight in the Union Army. Uh, let's see, Yankee Doodle, that's the last one. Yankee Doodle was the humor magazine, the first in America based on Punch. I'll get back on the screen. It was the first magazine in America based on Britain's Punch, humor magazine. Matthew had a heavy presence in that, including two parodies of Edgar Allan Poe, one of which was specifically a parody of The Raven with uh, lots of code saying that Poe was an imitator, that he did not write The Raven, and that uh, Matthew had written it. I've gone over that before. So that gives you an idea of the full extent of my legacy. Now, if you are Matthew's legacy and my collection of Matthew's legacy, if we get back in here, I mean, when I say that I have 2,300 of Matthew's uh, works, this is not counting the books now, because uh, if I get, that's digital. If I get into MFW works photographic, I've got photographic copies of these things, and that includes the books. So let's say that I go up here to Ace of Green Books. I've got digital copies of all of them. A Yankee Among the Nullifiers, this is between 33 and 34. Perils of Pearl Street, which I've shown you. The Debtor's Prison. Uh, the Life and Adventures of Dr. Dodamus Duckworth, which I showed you recently. That's two volumes. And Travels in America. Travels in America has cameo appearances from Joe Strickland, and uh, Enoch Timbertoes, two of Matthew's characters. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's one of the books, for example. Um, I can get into Burnham books. These are the books that Charles Burnham claimed that were actually Matthew's. Um, that's one of his books that's got a compilation. But this is Nell Noel. That's a full-length book that was published in the flag, in the uh, flag of our union in serial form. I've got copies of it in serial form here, and I've got actually the uh, the book. It was published as a book. I've got that. 
Then the rag picker or bound and free, I've got a copy of that in here. That's uh, that's a long story. I've talked about that before. That's comparable. And William Lloyd Garrison compared it to Uncle Tom's Cabin. It had a similar impact. So uh, then I've got Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her uh, plagiarisms of Matthew and so on. And all the papers, I've got photographic copies of these, not of everything, but I've got photographic copies of quite a few things there. Um, but if we get out of that one and just go back to digital, some of these things only have one or two. But if we get into, for example, the carpet bag, I've got them in date order numbered where there's a large number of them. Let's go down 191 pieces that I've definitely rigorously identified as Matthew's work in the carpet bag. And they're all keyed in and it's all searchable, keyword searchable. And that's important because Matthew had certain phrases that he loved to use. So I can search this entire database to see how many times he used sublunary like he used in the Raven. So we get into the Boston Weekly Museum and here we have 250 roughly because I say roughly because sometimes I take them out or add one or whatever and don't redo the entire list, but roughly 250 in the Boston Weekly Museum. That's from mid-1848 until mid-1852. Let's look at the Portland transcript if you want to see something, and I'll sign off. This is the Portland transcript. You can see that I've added these early ones because I got into the 1838-1839 edition, and I added several with A, B, C, D. That's why I can't say that the total is exact. Occasionally, I might take one out. 322. So, so in the Portland transcript, 322. Well, that's running from 1838 all the way to 1875. You know, I'm not blowing smoke with this. I'm not imagining this either. I was uh, over 11 years. I've been because it means so much to me personally, and because I hate to be caught out being wrong, and because I think that nobody's going to pay any attention to this until after I'm dead. For all three reasons, I was very, very, very careful, and I erred on the side of caution, always. So when I say that I have 332 pieces that were Matthew Franklin Whittier's work under all these different pseudonyms in the Portland transcript, I'm not kidding. I'm not guessing, you know. I could be wrong about a few. I might be wrong about five, but I, was, I would guess no more than that. And in the possible section, let's go look at that. In possible in the Portland transcript. That's POS MFW means pieces that could possibly be Matthews. I've got 32 of those, you know, that I wasn't sure about. And some of them are probably Matthews work. Well, you know, I don't know what to say about all this. This is running long again. I'll have to do quite a bit of editing on it. I could do this all day, you know, and I probably bore people to tears. I don't know. But I'm just trying to give a sense of the sheer scale of this thing. What I found over 11 years. And, you know, I tried to put most of this in my books. That's why they're so long, because each thing would relate to every other thing. So when I found, for example, in the carpet bag, a piece about puffing, well, oh, there it is in the, you know, way back in 1834 in the perils of Pearl Street that was falsely claimed or mistakenly claimed for Asa Green. See, there he is again. And there's other examples in the Constellation, earlier examples. That whole thing about uh, drumming was a little series in the Constellation when Matthew was editing that paper before he wrote The Perils of Pearl Street. And then it comes up again in the carpet bag. Asa Green was definitely not writing for the carpet bag. Plus, you know, you can see Matthew's Quaker values all the way through the Constellation. You can see it all the way through the star-signed pieces in the New York Tribune that were supposed to be Margaret Fuller, and so on. So you can see Matthew's kind of jaundiced view of nationalism all the way through in his legacy, not just in the star-signed pieces in the Tribune. So I said the last entry that... When someone gets their name attached to one of these things, it's like pulling a tick out of your skin to try to get them away from it or to get it away from them. It's like it's, it's deeply embedded in the unconscious mind of society and all the individuals and all the scholars. They can't get past it. They, that's their a priori assumption 
that everybody knows. See, they, they express it, everybody knows. Everybody knows Margaret Fuller was the star. Everybody knows that Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol. And everybody knows that Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven. And therefore, if you say anything different, you're just automatically dismissed with that a priori ass assumption in place, firmly in place in your subconscious and unconscious mind. It's a knee-jerk reaction. But if you could separate yourself from that reaction long enough to be objective, long enough to look at the evidence, you'd find that the plagiarists and the false claimants and the mistaken claimants do not have nearly the backstory or the, or the objective claim to these pieces that Matthew Franklin Whittier had. And in the instance of A Christmas Carol that Matthew and Abby had, their backstory is much deeper and much more consistent. And the way I know that is I've got this humongous database of their work. You know, not so much of Abby's. Let's go and look at Abby's for a minute before I close this down. Um, I also have all of Abby's work. And uh, it's up here at the top. There's her digitized works and there's her photographic. The digital works I have not separated by publication, but how many of them are? 44. And then there's possibles, a few possibles. There's a couple that definitely are not. Um, but let's look at her photographic because that I have broken down by, uh, by the publication. American Monthly Magazine. I think those were submitted by Albert Pike, who was her classroom teacher in 1830. Uh, Boston Weekly Museum. Those are the ones that Matthew published for her posthumously. Um, and a few others here. Um, there's that one book, which is uh, Chanticleer, a Thanksgiving story of the Peabody family. That was primarily Matthew's work. Excuse me, it was primarily Abby's work. That's why I put it there. The Dover Inquirer, she was the co-author of those uh, letters, those 10 letters to the editor that were pro-abolition. The New York Constellation, Matthew published at least one story of hers in there. Uh, the Philadelphia Album, her work was published quite a bit in there. I don't know who submitted it. Did she submit it? Did Matthew submit them for her? I kind of suspect that Matthew submitted those for her. Portland Transcript, she's in there. She's in there primarily after her death. Because after Matthew died, he or before he died, he apparently sent her last poem written on her deathbed to his editor on the Portland Transcript and asked him to print it after he died. And it's uh, too difficult for me to read. It's too personal. I'm not going to, uh, excuse me, I'm not going to do that. Uh, Rose of Sharon, one of her poems shows up in the 1841 Rose of Sharon, which I haven't gone into. Um, and then the carpet bag, uh, at least one of her stories, a Christmas story uh, that she wrote unsigned, shows up in the carpet bag in January 1st or something like that, uh, 1853. Uh, the Liberator, there's one of her poems in The Liberator. And then one of her poems in The National Era. Shall we look at the poem in the Liberator? Let's look at that. Okay, you should have this on the screen now. This is signed with her full maiden initials, the initials that she used when she got married. ARP for Abby Rochemont Poyen. It's in the Liberator, William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. It was published on February 16, 1838, which is just about when Matthew launched his own newspaper, the Salisbury Monitor. Apparently, she had submitted it to the Liberator before he'd made this decision to start his own paper. That's what I think. Otherwise, it would have been in the Monitor, their own paper. She starts out quoting Cowper. Um, I would not have a slave to till my ground to fan me while I sleep. She quotes him, and then she writes her own poem. I'd have no slave to till my ground to fan me while I sleep, to walk my humble dwelling round from midnight foes to keep. No, not for all the gold that grows in deep Peruvian mines, nor all the ample wealth that flows through India's coral climes. I'd have no slave to toil for me to earn my food and clothes, his only recompense to be curses and threats and blows. I'd hold no man in slavery. It is a dreadful wrong. The rights of life and liberty to all mankind belong. 
My soul abhors despotic power, which takes those rights away, that makes the slave to tyrants cower their mandates to obey. I'd sooner spend my days within some dark and dismal cave than to be guilty of the sin of holding one poor slave. She was writing from Danvers. She may have been visiting someone there. She signs it A-R-P. That was Abby also, and it's published in The Liberator. Uh, no one would ever know who ARP was. I do. Uh, so you can get some idea of the database I have on her. Not near as much as I have on Matthew. She died at age 24, and we probably don't have near all of her work, But because uh, I don't think she published hardly any of her own work. Maybe those two under ARP. I would guess she took the pseudonym ARP because she knew that Albert Pike was claiming the work that she had written as AP and wanted to distinguish herself from him. Um, I mean, Albert Pike fought in the Civil War for the South, you know, as a general. So she, you know, that wouldn't have been him, definitely. Uh, technically, you could say there was some other ARP, but there's another one. You know what? I really don't care whether people sign out of these or not. Let's see. We've got another one under ARP, and this was a different newspaper. This one is called Religion. It was published in the Christian Register and Boston Observer on December 1st, 1838. This is after their newspaper had folded. This was when they had come to uh, Portland, and uh, they were writing for the Portland transcript, but for some reason she submitted this to the Christian Register and Boston Observer, I think because it was a Christian paper. So um, I'm going to read this. It's very short, but this will give you some idea of what Abby, the mystic, thought of religion. She says, from hollowed shrines let fragrant incense rise in wreathing volumes to the azure skies and speak the grateful homage of the soul when man would own his maker's high control. But costly spices on the marble mound or perfume scattered on the humbler ground or prostrate heads or bended knees alone find no acceptance at the heavenly throne. Tis the pure heart, devoted and sincere, bowing in grateful love and holy fear, the upturned eye and the imploring gaze, the heartfelt prayer and joyous songs of praise. Tis the firm faith and actions free from guile, the mind exempt from thoughts which may defile, the strict obedience to our Maker's laws that prove the votary of religion's cause, A.R.P. So it's pretty clear what she considers real spirituality and what she considers just, you know, the outward forms of religion. And uh, I don't have to repeat what she said. It was pretty straightforward, you know. But this is Abby the mystic who is okay with religion as long as it expresses the real heart and the real devotion of a person, see. But as soon as it becomes just show, she has no use for it whatsoever. And, of course, her understanding went much, much deeper than that. But that was as much as she could get away with in a typical religious newspaper of the day. So this is far too long. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post it, I think. it's What I have now is an hour 31 minutes, which is way too long. It'll cut somewhat. Um, again, I just wanted to give an idea, knowing that people in denial are going to stay in denial, but I wanted to give some idea of the uh, sheer scope of this database that I have. So when I say that Matthew Franklin Whittier wrote this uh, under a certain pseudonym, and when I say that it was not this plagiarist or that plagiarist, and when I say that I can connect the elements, because I can connect through throughout this entire database, see? I can make connections from this point over here all the way, I don't see where I'm going, all the way to this point over here, or this point down over here, or this point up here, all the way from 1825 to 1875. You know, any any given piece, I could take the attributes of that piece and tie it in all over the map, see? So I can do that with the raven. I can do that with a Christmas carol. I can show the deep, deep context, how deeply embedded the elements of those that poem and that story are with Matthew Franklin Whittier and Abby Poyan Whittier's written legacy and their lives, because I've also got their 
extrapolated biographies, see? And I know their values, I know their beliefs, I know their, uh, I know their causes, you know. These people were imitators. Charles Dickens was pretending to be a philanthropist. He was pretending to be uh, a, a writer of deeply significant social commentary. Edgar Allan Poe was pretending to be a great poet who, who in his imagination had written a horror poem. See? Um, Margaret Fuller was pretending to be a child prodigy who was a genius and a, and a mystic and a transcendentalist. These people were phonies. And here's the catch-22. It takes an enlightened society to know the difference. So that's why they fooled everybody. They fooled everybody because there's too many people that are not at the required level of spiritual understanding to be able to see the difference. When society grows up and there's a preponderance of spiritually knowledgeable and advanced people, they will instantly look at these things and say, Margaret Fuller, the egotist, couldn't possibly have written these. You know, and Charles Dickens, the sensationalist, couldn't possibly have written A Christmas Carol, the skeptic and sensationalist. And Edgar Allan Poe, the sociopath, couldn't possibly have written The Raven because that's a real grief poem, you know. So the catch-22 is that when society grows up enough to where they can understand what I'm saying, I won't need to say anything. It'll be obvious. 